Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Radically Loved Podcast. I can't wait to introduce you to today's guest. She has been on the podcast a couple of times. I want to call her a Radically Loved Podcast regular. She is such an incredibly gifted licensed therapist. She's a relationship expert. Nedra Glover Tawab is here to talk to us today about Drama Free, a guide to managing unhealthy family relationships. And I can't tell you how immensely this book helped me during the holidays. It came at a perfect time and I cannot wait to share the tools she shares with us today on this podcast. Here's my conversation with Nedra. I am so excited that you're here again. Thank you so much, Nedra, for being You're welcome. Here. I'm happy to be back. Yes. I was, we were just chatting right before we started, but so I got the proof of your book right before the holidays. I'm going to just start with that because mm. it was, it came at the most perfect moment. I got it on December 13th. I know the date well, because the minute I started, to, <laughs> I, cause I read it in a day mm. in one day. Wow. Yeah. Which okay. means I did not put that book down. Okay. And I will say, man, I, there was a lot of self-reflection that I went during those days because I realized how much of my forgiveness was uh, perhaps practiced too soon. Mm. So so I learned how to identify uh, my own role in my healing journey uh, as you've you've discussed. And um, yeah, I'm excited to chat with you today. Um, I think one of the biggest things things that struck me the most was, and and it happened with your boundaries book as well. I think just learning to build that confidence to be able to speak my truth and to say how I felt and not feel like I'm being rushed to have a feeling like for the forgiveness bit was very poignant because during that week, I had just gone through a very big issue with a family member. And I was really going through this moment like, oh, okay, Christmas is coming up. We're going to see each other. I better hurry up and forgive this person. Or we're going to have really awkward conversations in front of everybody. So I just have to hurry up and do this. I went through the process and we had a conversation that felt very just, it did not sit right with me. It didn't sit right with my heart. I felt sick to my stomach because I felt like this person is obviously just like now going to think that I forgave them and they're just going to continue on their bad behavior. And I'm going to have to sit there and listen to it again. And that's exactly what happened, you know? And then as I, after I read your book, I was like, oh no, I'm like, that was too soon. I forgave that person way too soon. That was you too can fast. unforgive them. Let's talk about this. <laughs> By the way, yeah, please. Uh, what the inspiration behind this book? Tell us everything. Um. Well, let's see. I was born into a family with a lot of dysfunction, and I think that this book has been an ongoing writing experience throughout life. Even then when I didn't know I was writing a book, I was, you know, maybe unconsciously writing a book. I think it's so many of us who grow up with varying levels of dysfunction. I mean, dysfunction can look like 
anything from your parents having a tumultuous relationship to abuse and neglecting your home to, you know, all of the adults not listening to children. It's all sorts of things that can be unhealthy and very impactful for us. Um, Not being able to talk about things has never really been my way. Um, as early as, gosh, middle school, I remember having friends who, I remember this one friend I made, we were maybe in seventh grade and she started talking about her aunt and, you know, her family members doing drugs and these different things. And I was just like, oh, we're going to be fast friends because she was so honest. I just really appreciated it. Even, you know, at a young age, just being able to talk about real stuff and not sugarcoat things and and knowing that even though you love people, it doesn't mean that you can't be hurt by anything that they do or say or um, you can't want to fix things in a relationship. It's possible to have complicated relationships with people where you really love them. And there is also this you know, perhaps trauma or there is this level of dysfunction or there are these problematic things in a relationship. So this book, I think if you have a family, I'm not saying everyone grows up in a dysfunctional family. I don't believe that. But isn't there room for some level of improvement in family relationships, whether it is you know, with our parents, our siblings, um, in-laws, if we need to learn how to invite friends into family ships with us. You know, there are so many areas where we can, you know, be more thoughtful. It's not always about, I need to improve everything, but perhaps there are some things that I need to be more thoughtful about. Perhaps there are some things that I say that, you know, might be harmful to people. So even if you're like, well, I'm good. I know I'm a great family member. I don't have any issues. I would say, read the book and you might shock yourself. Mm-hmm. I was shocked, especially too, because I'm, I mean, I was shocked because I am also the person that's constantly on the journey to how do I be more mindful? How do I be a better person? How can I be more compassionate? How can I be more kind? But then I feel like there's been moments where I disregard how I really feel because I'm trying to be that person. And I think that that's what I realized when I was reading it. It was, it felt very much like, oh, if I'm doing the thing that you say, where I'm talking to all of my friends about, I forgave this person, but I'm still pissed and I'm still having this conversation like, oh, and then she did this and now she's saying this. And it's like, oh, there's still a big charge there for me. So, yeah. you know, and, and so I think that that's a really great Great point if you can speak to that a little bit more, because I think that for me, especially in Hispanic culture, like it it plays a huge role with this whole ability to uh, improve your relationships because we're sort of taught like you have to respect these people because they're older. Don't argue with them. You can't have any feelings. You know, uh, if you're upset, just let it go, you know, and this person essentially has a hierarchy in the family dynamic. So, you know, or you're being too sensitive, like just because they said that you don't have to take it personal. It's like, I'm allowed to take things how I take them because, Mm -hmm. you know, and so if you could speak to that a little bit more, I'd really love to hear your expert opinion on it. Yeah, I I think the culture is starting to shift um, a bit more now. But I would say with, you know, Black culture, Hispanic culture, with Jamaican culture and many cultures, you know, to be quite frank, I think there is this idea that kids don't have spirits. They don't have personalities. They're just these little people that are meant to absorb everything. When in actuality, I think it's quite the opposite. Kids are fragile, And the adult level of things that they are exposed to, they don't have a way to process it. They don't have a way to, you know, small kids don't have a way to process domestic violence. They don't have a way to process, you know, gun violence in their neighborhood or parents being laid off and them having to live with multiple, like, 
there's no way to process that. And a lot of times those situations are not discussed with the kids. It's just like they're constantly experiencing them. And then when you become an adult, it's like, wow, I have some thoughts about that experience. And it's not always, well, my mother was struggling or my dad, you know, it's like, one am angry. <laughs> I'm mad. <laughs> that, that happens too, because it was your life and you expected a certain level of care, a certain level of attention. And depending on who you're raised by, that is not possible. You know, I've talked to tons of people who may have been raised by grandparents who did a wonderful job, wonderful job raising their grandchildren. But at the end of the day, it's not their parents. And so they do still have those issues sometimes with their parent, even if they were raised in a great home, because it's like, yeah, my, you know, my grandparents were great, but where were you, mom? You know, so there are so many things that kids are expected to process without question. And I'm still having, you know, a hard time processing most of the adult stuff. <laughs> 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 without having a bunch of questions. So this idea that kids should just, you know, take everything is it's quite ridiculous. Yes, I 100% agree for the parents out there. And as a parent, how do you, how do you reconcile that as a parent for children? Like, how do you start to teach that at a young age? Well, sometimes people overcorrect and that's another level of dysfunction where you're telling your kids everything. Well, you know, your dad is a, it's like, oh, I, I, I didn't need to know about your sex life, you know, like too far. Right. So there are, there are levels to disclosure. I think you think about the child's age, not their maturity, because sometimes what we're doing is we're making them mature by telling them more and they still don't have the tools to process it. So really thinking about a child's age, I think, you know, when you watch Sesame Street and they have these, you know, these concepts on there, that's really how we're supposed to speak to kids about why people are different and, you know, all of these things. So there is a delicate way that we have to explain explain things at an age level that they can understand. Sometimes, you know, I think the issue with many of the, the, the people who raised us is they didn't understand what was happening. They felt out of control. They had their own trauma. They didn't have language for anything that was happening. And unfortunately, some of them still don't. And so their level of explaining things is what they could offer or not explaining things is what they could offer. We have, you know, whoever is listening to this podcast, we have the opportunity to do something different. We have a, a, a higher level of interest in parenting differently. Um, so there's, you know, there's an opportunity to teach our kids some of the things that we were not taught or some of the things that we didn't even know was important. You know, a lot of things that we now see as, oh my gosh, that was dysfunctional. It's like uh, most of the people born in the 80s were emotionally neglected. Oh, you totally. know, <laughs> look at little Kevin left at home by himself. You know, it's oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> in the book, I mentioned married with children and, you know, how they would be left at home with no food. And, you know, just, and that was normal. That was a comedy. Yeah. It was a comedy. It was hilarious that they didn't have any food at home. How they're they're looking around for food. And I, I, I laughed. I didn't know. I, I didn't know I was watching trauma. But you know, now we we have language, we we have the words, we know some of us, not all of us. I used to be a social worker, so that's why I'm saying not all of us. Yeah. You will be surprised how many people don't know. I remember I had to teach a woman how to clean her house. She really didn't know. She had children. The house had a certain odor to it. I was working uh, with another social worker who wanted to call Child Protective Services. And I said, hey, first step, we have to talk to her about cleaning. She may not know. And guess what? She did not know. Wow. So it's okay. So we're going to go to Dollar Tree. We're going to get some bleach. We're going to get some gloves. We're going to get some Fabuloso. We're going to get, we are going to, you know, scrub, wipe, 
<laughs> you know, like these, these are the things we want to do because we, we don't, I don't want your kids removed because, you know, your, your house is unclean. I want you to learn how to clean it. So how do we teach people those sort of things? Because we assume everyone knows and they do not. Yeah. And I think that that goes right back to learning about, you know, your own relationship dynamics and how we may think because we're on this healing path that everybody else understands and everybody Mm -hmm. else has the vernacular to communicate with each other with all of the different facets of healing and setting boundaries. And so I think it's, it's exactly, it relates completely to that, right? Absolutely. I I think when we get to a certain level of understanding in life or a certain perspective, we forget how ignorant we used to be. How we didn't know how to say whatever word that this person is mispronouncing or how we used to think, you know, like, I I don't want to be so far removed from that. Like, this was me five years ago. (laughs) I used to do this last summer. (laughs) It's like how far we've come just, you know, a couple of years ago. No, I, a couple I get of years it. ago. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's like, hey, don't forget. Oh, I mean, you know. this is the thing, too. This is another thing I wanted to talk to you about. It's like the the humility in this work, right, in that process. And I, I'm curious, actually, how your work as a social worker influenced what you teach now, you know, like how, how does that play a role in, in your work? Mm. Well, I I think social work is helpful for resource building, you know, instead of this is the only solution. I think about an assortment of solutions. That's probably why I make a lot of lists because I'm like, it's not one thing, it's many things. You know, these are all the, the different things that you can do because sometimes we do think like this relationship is bad. I have to get out of it. I'm like, Oh, well, that's the reaction. You won't have any relationships. You have no tools. So it it could be a bad relationship. That means getting out of it. And it could be a relationship that means you need to be more assertive. You need to be more clear about your needs. When someone tells, you no, maybe you really are taking it personal. And then saying, oh, they can never tell me no. So there, you know, there is room for um, many truths. And I think sometimes we only have one. And I feel like, you know, perhaps having that background, it makes me think about the whole person, entire situations. I'm not just thinking about like, oh, this, you know, this thing, this is the problem. It's like, well, I wonder how this parent got to the point of not doing this or, you know, maybe needing more support and being stressed. And this was the path they took. Or I wonder how this person, you know, got to the place of crime versus, you know, someone who went to addiction, like just wondering more about people and not forming my own story and saying, oh, well, you know, this person, they can't be helped or this thing is that like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I think that's why your writing is so impactful because it is multifaceted and it is it does make you feel like you're seeing the whole person and there's so many different pathways and the lists. I love the are you kidding? The lists are like everything. And I really do appreciate that perspective and I know that a lot of people do. And I think just going back to what you were saying about, you know, this this idea of having people learn the tools and having people be able to implement them and not fee- not be so, uh, you know, laser focused on, oh, now this is the one way, this is the only way to do this now. There aren't any other solutions. This is the only way or I'm going to throw this relationship away. Mm-hmm. So can you tell us a little bit more or, or what your take is on, you know, people that are trying to find alternate ways to having relationships in their lives. Because I do know a lot of people, especially in the spiritual community, it's like the minute that you don't get on board with their path, oh, you're being resistant, your shadow is showing or whatever languaging they use. It's like, seriously? I'm like, what? Okay, so now because you think I'm being my shadow side, whatever the Mm. fuck, 
I don't know. I mean, this is like, I'm just using <laughs> languaging, right? That's been used on me. It's oh. like, oh, my childhood trauma, your childhood trauma is showing and in your inability to understand where I'm coming from. It's like, what? Oh, okay. Uh, mm. How about like, we let's have a conversation that's a two-way street, you know? So how, <laughs> I don't know why I went into that situation, but how would one deal with, yeah, how, how would one develop the skill to be able to hear another person's perspective, I guess. You know, I think sometimes there's this idea that when we talk to people, it's about us always agreeing or somebody being right. And if it's not this way, then we have to push it more towards that. And I think, you know, to some extent, things require compromise, but not everything does. Mm. And Sometimes when people decide to live their life in a certain way, it's not really our job to get them to change that or get them to think like us or be like us. It's sometimes just acceptance. You know, there may I, I think about, you know, maybe the person in my family who doesn't season their food well. Like, do I have to make them put more salt or do I just add salt after they like put this dish in front of me? Do I need to give them cooking skills so they can cook for me or should they be cooking for themselves? I think they should cook for themselves. And this is how they like their food. But lots of times, oh my gosh, this is the issue and you need to change it. So everybody is like, I think lots of people are okay where they are. And, you know, sometimes we're, we're trying to get them to be like us, whether it's, you know, whatever spiritual process, whatever cooking process, whatever political process. Now there are some things that are harmful. And drama free, I can only think of, and you let me know, you read the book. I can only think of one instance where I'm very clear that you should not have a relationship. That instance is sexual abuse. Because um, there is, especially when kids are involved. You know, when kids are involved, um, let's say you have kids and you have this relationship with a person, there's no real way to like protect. So that's that's the only situation where I'm like, that is a safety issue. Pretty much everything else. I'm like, how do you want to handle this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes I will get questions that are very like, my father is this. Should I stop talking to him? I don't, I don't, that's not enough information. <laughs> you know, I, you know, my father is an addict. Should I stop talking to him? It depends on what he's doing. It depends on if you want a relationship with him. Um, how is the, the addiction impactful to you? Like, is he borrowed? Like what's going on? Mm -hmm. You can have a relationship with an addict if that's what you want. Yeah, there is no like rule for that. I, perhaps there is a safety issue, but you have to figure out what that issue is and whether or not there are certain things that may come with that relationship that you may choose not to deal with. And there are other things where you figure out, you know, what some of the boundaries could be in that relationship. So it's really hard to say the only way to deal with this thing is to leave the relationship. Sometimes we have to get really creative in how we deal with people. One of the stories that I mentioned in the book is, you know, someone having a sibling with pretty severe mental health issues and them saying, let's meet at this restaurant near my house or that sort of thing versus, you know, maybe that family member can't come to your house because of their anger outbursts or their disruptions. But does it mean you can't have a relationship with them? Sometimes our work is to figure out how can we have a relationship with a person who has demonstrated some certain things. So, you know, it's choice. Mm -hmm. Relationships are a choice. And so, your level of impact, the, the history of the issue. Is there a mental health thing happening? Is, you know, is the addiction changing the, the relationship? Those are all things to consider before saying, oh, you know, my mother-in-law is terrible. I need to stop talking to her. Well, I, d does your partner want to do that? <laughs> right. And I think this is where going back to the list and why I love them so much is because they the the function for me is gathering the data 
right? It's like you're doing self inquiry. You're you're seeing you're an- answering all of those questions, right? That you listed. Mm-hmm. You're like, well, how how does this impact you? What kind of addiction is it? It's not just like, okay, should I leave this person because we don't have anything? Or you know, yeah, like our political views are different. So should I stop talking to this person? It's like, okay, mm-hmm. but. Let's get a little bit more Mm -hmm. data in that. And so I I think that that's absolutely helpful for a lot of people because it it makes you put the effort in and it allows you to have a a wider perspective on the situation. It's not so uh, this or that, right? Um, Mm -hmm. One of the things uh, that I do want to just briefly discuss is unforgiveness. Now we started the conversation with unforgiving. So can you tell the audience what unforgiving is? Well, I I do talk about toxic forgiveness and I think, you know, that sort of ties into unforgiveness. Toxic toxic forgiveness is when we forgive people before we're ready. We pretend to be unbothered or okay with stuff. Oftentimes it'll come out as passive aggressiveness. I've certainly heard people, you know, kind of whisper to me and they didn't give me the $20 back from last year. It's like, Uh, It seems like you're still really bothered by your $20. Do you want to give them another 10? (laughs) Um, It sounds like you need to have a conversation of now you will owe me $30 (laughs) because I never got my 20 (laughs) because you are very bothered by that. Um, And that's okay. Here's the thing. it's your stuff. You have a certain expectation. You have a certain expectation of how you'd like to be treated and and these sorts of things. So if you have an issue with something and you find that I tried to quickly get over this and now I'm in this space of, gosh, I'm still really bothered by it. You can be. Everything is not this like overnight process of releasing We are humans, we have feelings, we have a lot of stuff going on. And sometimes we're triggered by other things that'll bring that feeling right back up. That's all normal. I think what's what's abnormal is us trying to get over all the stuff. That's actually more of the weird part is that we're like, you know what, this person did all these terrible things and I'm just gonna get over it and, you know, go have Christmas with them. It's like, what, they did what? Yeah, (laughs) I know. Yeah, that's that's the part where I was literally stopped in my tracks because I was like, wait, wait, what is happening here? And I'm like, oh, I'm yeah. a toxic forgiver. You know, I mean, I had all the realizations. And I think part of what I think happens in, in this process, because one of the questions was, yeah, like, what's the rush to forgiving? Why do we feel like it needs to happen right away? You know, what is, where does it say that I have to do this in a certain time frame? And I think it goes back to what we were talking about before, you know, like this, however we were raised, where we're told you have to get over this quickly or mm-hmm. oh, apologize to your sister or do this in this short amount of time frame so that we can move on and get over it and just not be in the discomfort. Mm. Well, one really beautiful skill my mother taught me is you can be kind to people without liking them. My mother always practices whenever I would break up with someone after I broke up, she'd be like, yeah, because I didn't like them because da 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 da. you be like, girl, but I was talking about you. And she was like, because you chose them. <laughs> so I didn't want yeah, I didn't want to say anything, right? Like I didn't want to get in your business, but you know, you would never be able to tell. I mean, she, hey, how are you? She's just as nice and pleasant. And then she, you know, she's like, you know, that person. Did it. <laughs> but she, but she's able to get along with people despite how she feels about them because she understands, you know, that's a person. You should still say hi to them. That's my neighbor. I'm still not. Do I like that they, you know, park on my grass? No. (laughs) Would I rather I had a different neighbor? Yes. (laughs) But if they're going to live there, I'm going to say hello. I'm going to be pleasant. I'm going to do all the things that I need to do. And I think sometimes we forget that we can practice that. Like I can not be over something and still come to your house for this gathering. I can still, you know, maybe call you the next day and still be, like multiple things can be happening at Mm -hmm. once. Yeah. 
Oh, I love that so much. I I want to be respectful of your time. And I, I do have one more question. Um, I think this is just mostly in regard to you and your own practices, like how with your career and having, you know, all of the, the responsibility that you have, like, how do you put these practices into play in your life? And um, what is the one thing, if there is one that you can think of thing that you learned the most from writing Trauma Free? With writing this book, I think I learned to get out of my story. Sometimes we feel like what happened to us is so unique. And so like it is it's like the more people you talk to, the less unique your story becomes. Right. It's like if you're like irritated by waiting in a long line, ask the people behind you. (laughs) They're irritated, too. Look how look how everybody feels the same way. You know, so I, I think sometimes we feel like what's happening to us we're alone in it and we're we're really not we just need to talk to more people there are some situations that i've never heard of before but many of the things that i hear it's like repeat repeat you talk to you know a few people who have parents as alcoholics and it's like okay got it you talk to a few people who've experienced um you know maybe having a controlling parent or the you know their father not being present there are some common things and I always hope that they meet other people like them you know and the way that we do that we have to be more vulnerable We have to be willing to talk about these things because we feel like our issues are so big because we don't know anybody else in the situation. And there's so many people that we could be connected to, but they may not know that we're looking for connection. They may not know what our story is. I have a practice of, I mean, you know, when I was younger, all of us, we could really slow pace these friendships. We could, you know, meet a friend and talk to them every day. Now I don't have a lot of time and I'm still open to friendship. So I'm like, you know, about that fifth friendship meetup, uh, let's have a real talk. <laughs> You've passed all of my tests. You've got to the fifth round. You know, let's, okay. Uh Tell me everything about your parents. All right, first time, let's go. Um, Tell me about, okay, so you said, and like, just give it all to me so we can get all the vulnerability out of the way and get back to the er everydayness of it. Because I want to know people. I want to know your Mm -hmm. whole story. I don't want you to just be like, yeah, both of our kids go to gymnastics. Like, girl, come on. Yeah. Who, who are you other than that? So it's it's really important that we really talk to people and not just the surface level, you know, working with people every day, being in these associateships. We really get to the core of, you know, who our parents are, who our grandparents mm-hmm. are, our siblings, because even though we grow up with them, our experiences can be so different that we get to the core of what's going on with folks. Mm. Wow. I love that. I mean, it's the depth, right? You're looking for real relationships, real connection and vulnerability and for people to be able to be honest. So it sounds like that's a really important practice for you. Oh yeah. I appreciate the honesty. I say that when people are honest and I could tell it's been really hard for them. Like, I'm like, I appreciate it. I'd, I'd rather you just say no. I don't, I don't want you to drag out a yes and not really want to do it because it shows in your effort. (laughs) Just just say no. I'm okay with that. Oh, I love this. Well, thank you so, thank you so much for being here. We love having you on the show. You are like a radically loved podcast staple. Let me tell you. Uh, Well, we've talked about your book, uh, your How to Set Boundaries book, like on the podcast just so many times, you know. And so, yeah, I really feel like you're just such an important part to this podcast and this community. So I want to say thank you again for doing this. And um, before I ask you the final question, I'm curious if your answer is going to be different from the last time. So we'll see. 
we'll mm. have to like compare. Um, where can people go to for more information? My website, nudgertowop.com. Everything is there. Okay, great. We'll put that in the show notes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, it'll be in the description below. If you're listening on whatever platform you get your podcast, check the info button and all the links will be there. So the Radically Loved... Blah, 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 the Radically Loved podcast was started as a way to build a community, to uh, inspire, support, um, just create a safe space for people to feel radically loved. The idea is that we are supported by God, higher power source, whatever higher power of your understanding is, the universe works for us and not against us. And mm. it is our innate right to be and feel radically loved. So question to you is how do you feel radically loved i think intentional love feels like radical love can you give us an example yeah when you when you know someone is thinking of you when you know that someone loves you you know so, sometimes love is a feeling it could be a warm embrace it could be somebody you know making your cup of coffee before you wake up it can be you know someone texting you hey i was thinking about you how are you doing when someone is being intentional in their efforts that's how i know i'm radically loved i love that Thank you so much for being here again. And thank you all so much for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast and share this with a friend if you found great value in this conversation. Nedra, thank you again so much for being here. We love you and we love having you and we appreciate you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved Podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast, and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com. <laughs>